Welcome to our speaker. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I have to say, I know it's really annoying. I was going to fight the urge here. That it's always annoying to hear, like, when I was a kid, you know, this is what I had to deal with. But um, hearing all of these announcements was really exciting because I, I came to Tufts because it had such strong reputations in science and engineering and liberal arts, and I knew I wanted to do environmental work. And there were really great professors here. You guys didn't have the opportunity to take environmental biology with Professor Nickerson, where he would take you to the beach at the age of, you know, late 70s, pushing 80, stripped to a Speedo and march and dive in the ocean while he lectured to you. Um, so you didn't get that, but you have all sorts of really exciting events going on here and so many activities, and it's really exciting. It feels like there's a much more vibrant student-driven community on environmental issues now than when I was here. I ran or co-ran ECOS for three of the years that I was here, uh, and I also ran a successful divestment campaign here. We divested from Hydro-Quebec at a time when it was proposing really huge dam product, uh, projects for electricity that wasn't needed in Canada, that it was looking for purchasers for, and that was going to flood a huge, a very significant portion of Cree homeland. So happy to talk to the divestment movement people about tactics. We had some really, we had a lot of fun doing that. and. Uh, it up with a, with a good outcome, I think. Uh, also, very jealous of the data people uh, when I was here. Now I'm going to do the back in the day. I had a, my computer was a brother word processor where you basically would plug in your typewriter and type and then push a button and it would automatically type it all like a line at a time on your paper and that was super uh, advanced at the time, you know, so you could at least check mistakes in a line at a time before you hit enter. Um, but no internet, no email. So this is very, very exciting also just to hear about geospatial resources and statistical um, resources that you've got with them, and I urge you to use them all. Um, I have a presentation today. I was asked to pick a particular topic. One of the things I love about my career and my current job is I get to do a lot of interesting work and a lot of in interesting issue areas, at least to me, which is what's important. You always want to Pick a career that's exciting and passionate for you. Um, so I have to pick a topic. I have a presentation on this topic. I have a lot of slides, but I used to be a litigator, and I found that you know I would prepare an entire presentation. I would prepare visuals if that were necessary. But if I actually got through my entire presentation without a judge asking me a question, there was a problem. So I don't intend to actually get through this presentation. I would love for people to be asking questions, break in, make comments. Um, just would like to make this an, an interactive exercise. So I have got a couple of early slides just about my career path, just so that, you know, get a little flavor for it, and then I can break and ask if you have any questions about how I got to where I am right now. It was a long and windy road, all very fun, so happy to talk about any of it. I, uh, like I said, or I think Ninian said, I graduated here with a BA in political science um, at a year probably before most of you were born. Uh, I also almost got an environmental studies double major, and you know, the decisions you make when you're 20 years old, perhaps you guys are smarter about these things, but I was going to have to take organic chemistry as a summer class because I was studying abroad my junior year, and that just seemed like a bridge too far. So that was. For that reason, I did not uh, get that second major, but had done a lot of work on environmental policy and environmental science here. So I took that training from Tufts, and I went and worked in a couple of environmental nonprofits. So I worked on Capitol Hill for a while, lobbying on public lands forestry issues. I then did an AmeriCorps stint in Washington, D.C., because it felt sort of disconnected to me to be living in an urban environment and talking about wilderness areas when there were a lot of environmental issues in my backyard. So I did Neighborhood Green Corps, which was an AmeriCorps program that embedded you in small nonprofits that didn't have a budget to hire extra staff. I spent half a year doing childhood lead poisoning prevention work and the other half of the year doing urban gardening. I loved the urban gardening and urban planning issues, and so I then moved to California and worked at the San Francisco League of Urban Gardeners. I don't know if you guys have ever been to San Francisco. Very, very built up place, very, very urban place, and yet there are some of these open acres, usually by public housing projects, undeveloped and for a long time really neglected. We turned this three and a half acre piece of property 
near the highway um, in the sort of southeast of San Francisco into a huge working farm that still exists today. So I worked there for a few years, then went to law school. And my first summer in law school, I actually tried to apply for, I did apply, but uh, for a job with EPA in San Francisco, the Environmental Protection Agency. I decided that's where I wanted to work after school. I missed the deadline, so I turned in my application late, which is not something that I would normally advise. But I get a call the day after I unsuccessfully uh, applied for this thing from EPA, and the person on the other end of the phone says, well, you missed our deadline. That's the bad news. The good news is we have a, a contingent here today from the Attorney General's office from the Northern Mariana Islands, and they're looking for an environmental intern this summer, and your resume is sitting here in our desk, and it looks like you might be interested in this kind of work. Do you want to go to Saipan for the summer? I had no idea where Saipan was, and I said yes. So I flew to Saipan, amazing place. Um, the Northern Mariana Islands are a U.S. territory of the U.S. Of a U.S. territory. Um, Saipan has a long and storied history, military history. It's been occupied over the centuries by Spain, then Japan, then after World War II, the United States. It was not on a map between the end of World War II and sometime in the 80s when it officially became a territory. It was a U.S. military training base where we trained soldiers for Vietnam, Korea, uh, and just uh, um, did a lot of damage there. So both at the end of World War II, a lot of the military equipment that we had on various Pacific islands, we didn't bring back home. We just dropped on islands. At low tide, you see things like Marshall tanks, unexploded ordinances, you name it, um, around Saipan. Right to the, the next biggest island in this chain is Tinian. Tinian has not a whole lot on it. There are people who live on there, but three quarters of it is behind barbed wire fence and you're not allowed to go in there. There's a one long airstrip down it called Broadway. It's called Broadway because this was part of the Manhattan Project. This is where the atom bombs took off to be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So really interesting history, one I did not know much about before I got there. My job for the summer was to work with the Attorney General's office and build a case against EPA for a botched military dump site cleanup. Later in uh, law school, I went to London. So I went to the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and I studied international environmental law, which is really interesting. I'd already I'd gone to the University of California, Hastings, in San Francisco. I had taken all the environmental classes they had there, which weren't too many, and so I just started making my own path and went to a school that could offer more classes for me. Um, from there, I went to the Department of Justice. So I found out in my third year of law school that EPA was not the only place you could do environmental law in the government. I went to this career day, and there was somebody there from the US Department of Justice. And it turns out that whenever EPA starts an enforcement action against a company, if they're going to file in federal court against that company for violations of the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Superfund, uh, RICRA, the waste statute, they hand the case over at that point to the Department of Justice. So I became an environmental enforcement trial attorney. I was there for seven years and mostly did Clean Air Act litigation against coal-fired power plants. Uh, really exciting, really interesting. It's, I gotta say, if any of you are interested in becoming lawyers or litigation, there's really nothing that matches standing up in court and saying, I'm, I'm here for the United States. I mean, it just is I don't know. It, it carries a lot of weight, and it was something very important to me and dear to me, and I really loved that work. Um, President Obama, so I was, I was actually at the Department of Justice for most of the W administration, the George W. Bush administration. Really interesting time to do enforcement. Another nice thing about being at the Department of Justice versus the Environmental Protection Agency is once suits are filed, you have ethical obligations to the court and there can be a lot less political interference in the work that you do. Most of the cases that I worked on while I was there had been filed in December of 2000. So this is going back a little ways, but for those of you who are uh, sort of election junkies, it was about a week after Bush v. Gore was decided, and the Supreme Court decided that Al Gore was not going to be president, but George W. Bush was going to be. At that point, EPA and DOJ filed lawsuits against the 10 biggest coal-fired power plants, figuring 
all right, well, we're going to have these already filed and in the works, and when the next president comes, they've, they've got to continue these cases. And so th that was the work that I did for most of the time I was there. Um, president Obama was elected. Both houses of Congress were uh, controlled by Democrats who seemed to be interested in doing something about climate change. I had gotten more and more interested in climate change. Got swept up in the enthusiasm of maybe we can do something about that. About a week after the House passed climate legislation, I got a job uh, with Senator Whitehouse, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island. I became his chief environmental counsel, and I ran his oversight subcommittee on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. It was a really exciting time to be there, although when I left there four years, three and a half years later to come to Harvard Law School, a friend of mine created this big chart and blew up this poster and had it at my going away party of, um, it was a line graph of prospects for climate legislation, and they were sort of going along well, and then there was a, line, a vertical line of when Kate came to the Hill, and then it sort of dropped from there. So I think it's correlation and not causation, but soon after I was there, I mean, I was there for 2009 um, into 2010. I went to Copenhagen on behalf of the senator at the uh, climate negotiations. Uh, worked on the climate bill that was being worked through. There were actually two different versions in the Senate. I worked on both of those. They didn't cross the finish line. I was also there for the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of, Mex uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and did a lot of oversight work on that. So happy to talk about that as well. Um, oh. All right. So and then that brings me to Harvard. So Harvard, I uh, just happened to see I was working with a bunch of environmental law professors in my job for, with the senator, thinking about ways we could reform laws to make it harder for another deep water horizon to happen again. And so I was putting on an environmental law listserv so that I could be asking professors for advice and help and seeing if anyone was doing research that might be relevant to our work. And a professor from Harvard sent across, uh, you know, emailed everyone, like, hey, this is part of this chain, but I just wanted to know if anyone uh, knows of somebody we're thinking of starting a policy shop we haven't put together uh, a job description yet the ideal person would have at least 10 years of experience half on at doj half on the hill we don't know anyone like that but if you do please let us know and i was like well I, that, that describes me so i uh emailed them and and then ended up being hired there to start a policy shop so we called it the harvard environmental policy initiative and the idea was to work in issue areas where law needs to play catch up. So there's something about, we have a new understanding of risk because of a science breakthrough. We have a new way of producing oil and gas because of technological breakthroughs. We have market shifts and suddenly the way the world was when we wrote a particular law is no more. And there's, this is very common in the law. The law is quite frozen in time and, and often does not evolve as quickly as it should. There's a whole interesting area of environmental law right now trying to build on ecosystem and eco ecological concepts of adaptive management and thinking about can you build into a law look back periods, the ability to tweak things without having to go all the way back through a formal rulemaking process. Are there ways to make the law more uh, flexible and nimble? But until we've got that, we've got the laws we have. And so trying to figure out how do you reinterpret them to meet these new challenges or how do you propose changes to them? I do not take on clients. We don't take on clients in our policy initiative, which was also really interesting and different for me to go from being a litigator, where it's very clearly black and white, one side is right, mine of course, and then the other side is not, um, to then the Hill, which is very transactional, and you're meeting lots of people and learning lots of things, but I'm still working for a senator who's very strong in the environment and from a state that's very supportive of his efforts in that. So, still in that sort of black and white world and now being in a place where I don't take on clients and I'm trying to be an honest broker and sort of come up with independent research for policymakers to come up with. It was a little bit of a, a different for me and a challenge. So before I jump into one of our issue areas, which is unconventional oil and gas and sort of how I thought we should approach it and some of the work that we've done, does anyone have any questions about Anything I've talked about so far? No? All right. If you get brave later on and have a question back from any of this, please let me know. 
<clears throat> okay, so unconventional oil and gas. This ended up being one of the four issue areas that I picked for the policy initiative. It is an extremely controversial topic. It was a topic where very clearly did not have laws on the books to capture exactly what was happening. And so the, you know, my first order of business was to figure out what is fracking? What does it do? Why are we doing it? Where does it happen? So I talked to engineers. I talked to scientists. I've become really good friends actually with someone who's a PhD physicist and uh, has worked at one of the oil service companies, which are the companies that actually do most of the frack jobs. Uh, they have a research and development shop in Central Square. So I just sort of cold called those guys one day and, and asked for help and have ended up really becoming very good friends with someone there who's got a lot of technical knowledge that I really depend on and rely on for a lot of the work that I do. So very, very brief overview. For a very long time, oil and gas was developed in conventional reserves, meaning underground reservoirs. You, we always think of it as this sort of pool underground that's for those, is there, are there any geology majors in here? Okay. <laughs> so check me if I'm wrong on any of this, but you don't actually ever have a pool of of fossil fuels under underground, but you do have more permeable rock where over time, you know, you sort of have biological matter that with heat and pressure over time has turned into the fossil fuels, oil being liquid at earth surface pressure, natural gas being gas at surface pressure. They move from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure and find some of these layers of rock that have higher permeability. For a long time, the name of the game in oil and gas development was finding those reservoirs. People would sometimes look for formations on the surface as we ended up getting more technologically advanced. You use sonar and other information to figure out like what the layers are underground and figure out where those reservoirs are. They're usually quite pressured because they're overlain by then tighter rocks. And so once you get a well bored in there, the pressure of the reservoir, at least at first, would be enough to push the product out of the ground. We've developed almost all of our conventional reserves in the United States, and that's one of the things that I think sometimes gets missed. Um, there's this talk about this great technological breakthroughs. We thought we were running out of oil. We thought we were running out of gas, but we're not because now we've got fracking and unconventional reserves. The thing is we've gotten all the easy stuff already. So what we're doing now is going into the source rock. We're no longer waiting for those discrete molecules and extremely impermeable rock to slowly make their way through thousands of years into reservoirs. We've already used all those reservoirs up for the most part in the United States and are now having to go into the source rock and pull molecule by molecule of fossil fuels out. This means great ingenuity. The people who came up with this, astounding. But it means a lot more input, more concrete and more steel because we have longer wells they are now going a mile or two into the ground and then turning and horizontal drilling then going through that, that target formation another mile or two. A lot of water input, a lot of chemical input, a lot of sand input. So once they have these wells, they send charges down them that look like little missiles. They blow holes out the side of them and then they fracture the well by putting high volumes of water and chemicals at high pressure into the well. They go out of those blow out holes and they fracture the rock. They carry with them sand and the sand stays there to prop open those tiny little cracks so that you can continue to produce after the water is brought back out of the well. Saudi Arabia still has a lot of conventional reserves, so do other countries. So you can still produce a barrel of oil in Saudi Arabia for under $10. Uh, it is costing almost $50, 40 to $50 to produce a barrel using hydraulic fracturing and directional drilling in the United States, which is why when we've had low prices in the last couple of years, it's, been, it's put so much pressure on our industry here. So it really only makes money knowing that as we go out, we're going to be running out of conventionals around the world and prices will go up overall. So trying to figure out where to play in this space. There's obviously a huge contingent of people who feel like this was the one bright spot during our recession starting in 2007. Um, lots of jobs created in parts of the country that had been draining population for a very long time, North Dakota, Oklahoma, um, parts of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, a lot of people felt like this was reducing our dependence on foreign oil. This broke OPEC. OPEC tried to set the prices a few years into this, and it turned out they no longer set the price. It was the supply from the United States that was setting the global price, so it sort of changed geopolitics. There are people who are interested in the U.S. exporting more natural gas now to Europe because Europe is so reliant on Russia for natural gas. It has potential really interesting uh, geopolitical, non-environmental um, implications as well as employment implications in the U.S. On the environmental side, a lot of proponents were saying, you know, this is driving out the use of coal for electricity. And it, it is shocking in the last 10 years how much coal has been driven out of the system. After fighting the coal industry as a litigator for seven years, I, I did not think they were going away anytime soon, but uh, they have, the use of coal for electricity has really dropped precipitously in the last 10 years in large part because of natural gas. On the flip side, on the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of people who are proponents of the keep it in the ground. This is, why are we doing this? It's just getting more and more difficult, more and more energy intensive to pull this stuff out of the ground. Yes, it emits half the carbon dioxide of coal for every megawatt hour of energy, but it's still producing a lot of carbon dioxide. Natural gas is methane. Methane is also in and of itself a really strong greenhouse gas pollutant. Uh, if we need to get to 80% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century, we're not going to get there by switching everything from coal to gas. This might be crowding out renewables in the meantime. It's definitely, natural gas plants are definitely driving down electricity costs in the country and forcing the shuttering of nuclear plants which you know, people have different opinions on nuclear, but it is 20% of our electricity right now, and it's all carbon-free, so what it gets replaced with is very important for carbon policy. You also have people very upset about the production um, of, frac of uh, natural gas and oil through hydraulic fracturing, what it's doing to communities. It's a much more intensive practice. You can get the same amount of oil or gas from fewer surface Spaces, well pads, but on each of these well pads now, they could be the size of a football field and have 12 wells on them. Um, given oil and gas law, which we won't get into, people have limited rights to say whether or not their property can be used to access minerals underground. So this has led to a lot of strain and tensions in communities between people getting royalties for this and people whose surface property is just being destroyed. Um, there's been a lot of concern about the chemicals being used. There have been stories of people's water being, you know, catching on fire coming out of their spigot because there's methane coming up into their water system, uh, often due to poor casing of these wells. So I walked into this with a very um, tough task of trying to figure out is there some way, without having clients, and being sort of an independent broker, is there some way to improve the environmental situation here without taking one of these sides? Now, personally, I might be on one of those sides, but this is sort of professionally, where am I taking Harvard Law School, and how can I get this program to improve environmental quality without sort of saying all or, all or nothing? So that was my challenge. So I thought, you know, one of the things that's important here is that, you know, as, since it's a new activity, we don't know a whole lot about it. We don't know where the water is going when it gets injected. Usually, depending on the play, between 10 and 50 percent of the water comes back out of the well once you fracture the well. It also brings up a bunch of produced water that um, just was naturally occurring in the formation. But where does the rest of the water go? You know, what are the chemicals that are being used, and do we know anything about them? It turns out our, our laws in this country, you, you can take chemicals to market without doing any toxicological research on them. So about half of the chemicals being used right now in hydraulic fracturing and of the ones we know of have never been studied. Um, you can make sort of suppositions about their toxicology because of you know, how they're related to other compounds you might know about, but for some, it's really just a, an open question. Um, what about, are there air impact and you have open impoundments of wastewater and people are living near there. What are we, are we testing that wastewater to know what it is? Do we know what it's off-gassing? Do we know what those um, health profiles might look like in those communities? Are there things we can do to reduce that risk? These are all open questions and none of the laws on the books at the state level, which states are the primary regulators of oil and gas, um, addressed this. 
uh, nor did the, the federal rules. So I got into thinking about how do we get information from the industry to figure out where the risk is. And this could tell us where to frack and where not to frack. This could also tell us if you're going to do it somewhere, these are the things you need to do to have in place to reduce the risk. So thinking about reporting and disclosure as regulatory tools, uh, you know, these are things that you can do if you're getting information from a company. It can help the regulator figure out what the risk is and figure out where to focus. It can direct their limited enforcement resources. They can figure out, all right, th there's a problem child over here. We're asking these guys to spill report, and this one well has been reporting spills every month. What's happening? We need to go out there. We need to shut them down. We need to require training. You can't do that if you don't have the information. Um, you can make enforce enforcement unnecessary. This is one of my favorite examples of the power of information. So for a very long time, you could list in your tax return um, names of dependents and you would get a tax credit for that. Uh, in 1986, and there were concerns that perhaps these were, some of these dependents were made up or were like the family dog. So in 1986, they changed the rule that you need to report the social security number of the dependent. That's it. There was no enforcement. There was no, you know, and if you don't do this, this is the penalty. It was just sort of a, hey, just an additional little asking for reporting information in a tax return. In that one year, seven million dependents disappeared. So you can use reporting as a way to get information and then also to change behavior. Likewise, disclosure, and this is one thing that's really important if you ever get into this kind of work. Reporting and disclosure are two different things, and companies will talk about reporting but may not want to talk about disclosure. Disclosure is getting it not just to the regulator, but to the whole world, to the whole public has a right to see this information. That does different things. Once you open the door and more people can see the information, in the oil and gas uh, world, there are lots of companies, and they are all different sizes. Unlike offshore oil and gas, which is dominated by majors, Shell, BP, ConocoPhillips, um, the shale gas revolution has really been driven by much smaller companies. It was risk takers with equity firms behind them doing this. Uh, that has a lot of, uh, that raises red flags about risk in many ways. These are not very capitalized companies. They often don't have a whole, like a deep bench of technical knowledge um, on the team. So it's helpful if you can see what the big companies are doing and the little companies can learn from them. You build public confidence when you know more about the activity, raise public awareness, and again, you induce change. So the Oreo example, is uh, the trans fats. Once it was required to report trans fats on ingredients, Oreos just changed their ingredients so they never had to report that that's what they had in their cookies. Uh, two other things. Input, it's important to design with compliance in mind. It's a felony to tamper with U.S. mail, but if we had just open baskets on city corners and you put your mail in there, a lot more mail would be tampered with, right? It would just be too tempting to walk by and see, oh, that looks, you know, looks like somebody just got something from Amazon and grab it and keep walking. If you design a mailbox, I mean, this is like one of the most ingenious designs. I don't know, there, was, there was a really interesting major here when I was here. This is like psychology and engineering, and I loved that. I had a couple of friends who did that. But this is, this is a perfect example. It's like it, you can put the mail in. You can't get it back out. It is in, you know, it, things don't get wet. You know, it's, it's pretty difficult to destroy. Um, so you think about how do you take in information that makes it easy for people to comply with the law, here not tampering with the mail. And then output, why are you asking for the information? So it, found, it turned out when I was looking at state laws, states often do ask for information from companies about oil and gas activities. But they were asking the wrong question. So it was just this paper exercise of you know, asking for sort of garbage information that wasn't going to be used to figure out how to regulate them better. Um, and as a result, the, the companies didn't really take it all that seriously. So I decided to look at hydraulic fracturing chemicals first because to me they were the fruit flies of this area. There's a lot of information that needs to get collected about fracking to, to understand the risk and to act uh, in response to that risk. But this was a place when I started working on this in 2012 where there was a lot going on. We'd had in 2005 in the Energy Policy Act in Congress, hydraulic fracturing had been exempted from the Safe Drinking Water Act. 
The Safe Drinking Water Act would have protected public water systems by requiring when you inject something in the ground that you ask, you know, you seek a permit for it, and in that permit you describe what it is you're injecting in the ground, and also what you're going to do with it if it comes back out, sort of what is, what's your disposal plan. Uh, by exempting hydraulic fracturing, it meant that that was the most plausible federal hook for actually getting the information about what are these chemicals that people are using to fracture wells. There had been in 1997 a federal case that had ordered EPA, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's sort of an interesting thing. Starting so in 1997, there had been a federal case that had ordered EPA in Alabama to start regulating hydraulic fracturing under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, there was coal bed methane. It was an early, uh, it was a, ex using hydraulic fracturing to get natural gas from coal mines or from coal seams. Um, they didn't want to do it. EPA in, in Alabama did not want to extend the program to cover hydraulic fracturing. They were under a lot of pressure from the industry and it just, it required also pulling back all the state Safe Drinking Water Act programs and rewriting them. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, EPA and, and the states did not want to do that. So EPA started studying whether there, were, there was something there to be concerned about. If we're fracturing, particularly coal seams are often, about 65% of coal mined in the United States is surface mining, so our coal seams tend to be pretty shallow, co-located with aquifers. And so there was concern that you, know, you could be fracking directly into underground sources of drinking water. And so EPA started doing some studies. And for some reason that I've never been able to figure out, and I've gone back and talked to people from EPA at the time and contractors who were working with them at the time about why they focused on diesel. But for some reason, they focused on diesel being of most concern. Diesel was certainly being used to fracture wells. It still is used to fracture wells, despite this carve out, um, although much less. It's also diesel compounds that are of concern. So benzene, ethylene, xylene, toluene. Um, they were used because they help sort of suspend the sand longer in the water that's being pressured into the well so that you still have sand floating, you know, being shot into all of the fractures. But there are a lot of other concerning chemicals being used as well. And so why EPA focused on those is unclear. But they had a series of studies in the early 2000s really pinpointing that, that's, that those are the chemicals that we are most concerned about. They signed an agreement with two, in 2003 with the three biggest service companies who actually did frack jobs who agreed in a very wishy-washy voluntary way. It's a, this agreement is not binding in any way, but that they would try to stop using diesel when they were fracking in coal seams. Um, you know, they said fracking in coal seams knowing that they were not going to be producing from coal seams in any great extent going forward. I and mean, at that point, the industry knew about shale gas. The regulators did not. Um, and so when they got to Congress and wanted a carve out, enough people had heard about diesel and were concerned about diesel that they said, okay, it's fine not to get a Safe Drinking Water Act permit for fracking, except if you're going to use diesel. Now since then, EPA has never set up a diesel permitting program, nor has it ever required states to set up a diesel permitting program. So when companies use diesel to fracture, there's no application for them to fill out to actually get the permit. So there's not actually ever been a permit issued. Uh, in 2011, uh, the House Energy and Commerce Committee sent letters to a bunch of companies and asked them if they were using diesel and got back information indicating that in the prior five years, about 30 million gallons of diesel had been used to fracture wells. So it's being used, but we haven't set up the permitting scheme for it, which has been another project I've been working on. So thanks for that. So 97 was that case I told you when, um, they, when it was the 11th Circuit required Alabama and EPA to start regulating hydraulic fracturing. 2005 is when we have a Safe Drinking Water Act exemption. So now hydraulic fracturing is not covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act. This is, meanwhile, the Barnett Shale, the first shale where we had economically viable hydraulic fracturing happening. A lot of activity. Uh, what started in 
the Barnett Shale just outside of Fort Worth, then went to Texas, I mean, then went to Pennsylvania, Colorado, North Dakota, Oklahoma. We now have more than 30 states who are using hydraulic fracturing to produce oil and gas. Yeah. Yes. What, what each dot is one of those giant wells, yes. is that right? Yes. Yes, and so the black wells are vertical wells. Those are the old-fashioned wells that you'd have just, and some of those were fractured as well. But the red are the much larger ones, the, the horizontal. So they go about a mile into the Barnett Shale and then turn sideways and go between a mile and two laterally. That's a pretty intense visual. Yeah, well, and you see where it is as well, like Fort Worth. And this is also, we've seen fracking encroaching on Pittsburgh. We've seen it in Dallas, Santa Fe. And those local communities have been really upset about it. That's another thing that's changed about oil and gas production. It can happen in so many more places, and it's been encroaching on urban areas that don't, are not familiar with this and want no part of it. So you've seen in a lot of parts of the country, local entities, either Fort Worth and Dallas, didn't ban fracking, but they just set up codes that were so stringent that made it impossible to come into city lines. Um, other cities have gone ahead and tried to ban it, and there have been a whole uh, number of constitutional cases where the states then sue their own cities and towns, telling them they're not allowed to ban the activity. So, yeah. So as fracking sort of grew bigger and more intense and started showing up in people's backyards and more people were concerned about it, there was this public outcry. Now, by the time this happened, Gasland, I think, came out in 2010. Um, Dimmick, Pennsylvania was a small community with water wells. This started to be, you know, this is what their drinking water was looking like soon after uh, oil and gas production began near their neighborhood or in their neighborhood. One woman's water well exploded because methane escaped into it and did a great deal of damage to her home. Uh, people started hearing about this. Now, of course, this is already years after Congress has sort of quietly exempted fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act, so we don't know what any of these chemicals are still. And people are upset about that. So you, this really drives that public big movement against fracking. You start to see a change in 2010. I mentioned earlier something that happened in 2010 in the oil and gas world, and that is the BP Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf. That really shook the oil and gas industry, as it should have, and they started getting worried about this fracking blowback, finally. They are, I have to say, this is an industry that is just tone deaf when it comes to public relations, and um, I say that having worked with a lot of industries. But, Deepwater Horizon worried them. And so a few companies, you started seeing them making voluntary disclosures, telling um, the public affirmatively what they were using in their frack jobs. There was a lot of conversation of, yes? What do you think that the they want to hear about? Yeah, hard. Oh, sure. Yeah, so the question was whether they uh, were being accurate and complete in describing the chemicals that were being fractured. Really hard to tell in terms of uh, uh, what actually went in the ground. It's impossible to access these sites. They have 24-hour security. Uh, states ask, even states now that are asking for chemical disclosure to ask for that list of chemicals that are coming on site, but there's no on-site testing to sort of true it up. Um, we do know from the analysis that I've done and others have done that they usually fail to report about 20%, so one in five of the chemicals, calling it a trade secret or confidential business information. Um, despite the fact trade secrets are a very real thing, it's important for people to be able to protect their intellectual property. Uh, companies first, like Halliburton, tried to go and get these frac fluids patented and couldn't because there was nothing really unique about them. It's sort of the same types of combination of chemicals that they all use. They're trying to suspend sand for a long period of time before it gets into the fractures. They need biocides to kill things from growing in the well. They need surfactants and other sort of things to uh, make the, you know, reduce friction as, you, as you're sending the fluid down the well. 
a lot of people in the industry will say, you know, we, it's not a huge surprise when we see these things. And yet, about one in five of the chemicals are not disclosed. Um, some of the companies have said we don't disclose the really green good ones because those are the ones we've spent the most time innovating. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I'll just leave that there. So, but really good question about trying to true this up because it's a very real question. Um, I did start doing this voluntarily. Wyoming is the first state in the country, other than Alabama, which was under that court order to do something, first state in the country to require chemical disclosure. Anyone want to guess why Wyoming would have done that? Wyoming's not normally known as like bastion of liberal progressive thinking. Yes. National parks. So could there, there was a lot of concern about fracking there in part because of parks, in part because they'd had um, Pavilion Wyoming had had a really high profile contamination case. So yeah, there was some local concern about this for sure. Yes. Interesting. No, but interesting. Yes. Cattle? Cattle? Mm, not, as, not as much. It was definitely I mean, a little bit of people were, you know, definitely people were concerned. It's also a place that doesn't have a whole lot of water. So we have found generally that Western drier states, regardless of politics, got onto this first. Wyoming also actually asked that if you were going to use certain chemicals like diesel, you need permission first, which is highly unusual in states. Most of them don't play that gatekeeping function. Any other? I'm sorry? Dick yeah, Dick Cheney's from Wyoming. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and Dick Cheney was also behind that 2005 exemption in the Safe Drinking Water Act. So it was called the Halliburton Loophole. Um, so Cheney gets us a little closer. So it's Wyoming's governor was really worried about the federal government stepping in. You know, the federal government's looking for something to do in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon. People are really upset about fracking chemicals. The possibility that the federal government might come in and tell Wyoming what to do with its oil and gas industry was enough for Wyoming to step up and act. Um, and they're quite frank about that. Press statements made that very clear the day that the governor made the announcement. Wyoming still has one of the toughest disclosure laws on the books, too. Today, about 26 states require uh, uh, disclosure, and almost all of those require it on Frack Focus, which is a website that anyone can go to, frackfocus.org. Uh, when I first started looking at frackfocus.org, you could only get PDF by PDF documents of each well. So you couldn't do any sort of analysis into, you know, across all wells, what are the chemicals being used? Um, it was being run by this nonprofit association of state oil and gas agencies called the Groundwater Protection Council. Kind of an odd name, but. Um, no lawyers there, no regulators there. This had no regulatory teeth. So even though states were saying, go and use this, people were just calling things trade secrets, didn't have to make any showing for it. Nobody ever reviewed this. Turned out, I would often find, you know, this would be called a trade secret here, but not in six other wells. So even they were just being inconsistent well to well about what they disclosed and what they didn't. Errors we found, like location of wells, it would say it was in Colorado, but the lat longitude would have it in the Pacific Ocean. Chemicals were named wrong. I mean, it was just really sort of garbage in, garbage out. So we put together a report and, and did the research that we could on Frack Focus and said, look, here, here's the thing. We're not taking sides in this thing, but we need disclosure. And if you're going to do disclosure, let's do disclosure. Like, let's not do this, like, fake parade thing that makes the companies feel good, but we're actually not getting any information. Let's, let's actually do something here. So Texas responded. A few other um, states responded. The Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, I did not know this thing existed before they called me and asked me to testify. They funded Frack Focus, so we're upset to find out it wasn't really doing its job. I went and testified, explained to them the things I thought you needed, like error trapping, drop down menus, things to make sure the information was at least accurate. And then you really needed to clamp down on the use of trade secrets and confidentiality. And you needed to aggregate the data so people could do analysis across the industry and not just do this well-by-well well PDF thing. They actually, the, it turned out Groundwater Protection Council would take all the information, turn it into PDFs, and then put it, you know, so they were doing an extra step to make sure that people couldn't look across. The advisory board came out with a series of recommendations. Uh, they 
cited heavily our work and basically just adopted those recommendations. And then I ended up working with the Groundwater Protection Council to come up with a new version of Frac Focus. I did not take them on as a client because we don't take on clients. So everything I worked on with them was totally public. Um, but we did make a lot of improvements. There's still a concern of, so error rates have dropped. You now can get the information aggregated. You can use this as a good research tool now. Um, still working on it. Lots of improvements that need to be made. And some of the improvements are making sure the states are using this. There's no one using this data right now. So they're not saying, hey, we noticed that you weren't using benzene and now you're using a lot of benzene. Why don't you come in and have a conversation with us about that? Or how about we don't use benzene anymore? There's, there weren't, no one's using this in any sort of gatekeeping function to say, use this, don't use this, tell me first if you're going to use this. So that's the piece we're working on right now. Another just quick example um, of how to use information, I got interested in working on spill data. So there's spills all the time. There's all these d debates about whether you, know, you have underground contamination of groundwater. That's an important debate and needs to be studied. But in the meantime, I was like, it doesn't, it's, it's definitely being spilled on the ground. We're having illegal dumping of trucks in woods. We're having, when you attach hoses from tanks to trucks, you've got spills. You have, um, sometimes it's not even spills, it's purposeful releases. Pennsylvania for a while was using the wastewater to put on roads to de-ice the roads until the naturally occurring radioactive material and some other nasties were showing up in surface waters in Pennsylvania. So we know this stuff is getting out. We know there's exposure. We're doing a great job of tracking this. And so this is another piece that I've been working on. I've worked with a team of researchers, ecologists, statisticians, one other lawyer, and we went through about 7,000 spills from wells in four states over a series of years. Many more spills occur. These were the only spills that you could definitely trace back to a particular well, because we were also doing analyses of which companies are spilling. And so lots more spills in this. These are the ones associated with wells. We were finding 15% of the wells are, have spills. And once they have a spill, the percentage of wells with more than one spill is higher than what would just be a random occurrence. So once you have a spill at a well, we're seeing repeated spills. There's definitely something going on at that well, whether it's the management of the company, whether it's the contractors they're using. That would suggest to regulators, if you track these things, once someone has a well, you need to be in that place a lot more often. Or you need to require training as soon as there's a first spill to make sure there's not a second one. We found you know, most of the spills are happening at the beginning of time. So that's when you should be focusing your resources, inspection resources, training resources. And half the spills were coming from tanks, temporary pipelines, and trucks. So that clearly said to us, states, that's where you need to focus. I'm part of a, a group now, a task force group with states writing uh, model guidelines for the temporary pipelines, because they were clearly, they're basically not addressed in state laws, and yet are about 25% of the spills that we're seeing on site. Lots of interesting causes. One of the most interesting causes we found in North Dakota were cows. So cows were going on to well sites that didn't have fences around them, scratching up against uh, you know, various like novels and turn, uh, you know, what are they called? Like a spigots, yeah, and opening them. And then by the time the company guy would come by the next day or the next week, there would be chemicals spilling on the ground. So you figure out where cows graze, cattle graze, and you fence in those oil and gas sites. So this by no means reduces all risk. This by no means justifies fracking everywhere. But it's a, hey, in some places this is happening, and these are really easy ways to manage some of the risk. So that's, that's sort of the intent here. Yeah. No. Um, Good. So then now we've just been working both with companies on their internal spill reporting and also externally with a bunch of states to try to increase, enhance their spill reporting to make sure they're getting good information that they then can act on. We're also working with one state. They just got iPads for their inspectors, and we want the inspectors to be filling in the same kind of information that the, the companies would in self-reporting so that you could have all the information coming from the different sources in one place to figure out what's going on. None of these things are happening. By the way, if any of you are into sort of big data and big data driving things, 
spend a half an hour with any state agency when, I mean, I've had, in order to look at some of their websites, I've had to disable Java on my computer because their website is from like 1987 and you can't speak to it if you have anything on your computer that is beyond that. I mean, it's so much data is in hard copy. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about, earthquakes were kind of running to an end, but uh, when Oklahoma started getting a lot of earthquakes starting about five years ago, they now get hundreds of earthquakes a year, the same number of magnitude three earthquakes, and in some years more than the state of California. Uh, when they tried to get a handle on this to figure out what's happening, where is this information, you know, where, where, is the, where are the earthquakes being, um, where are they starting, what's happening, they asked companies for information and companies just delivered hard copy of seismic readings, truckload after truckload of that. And that's walking into the Oklahoma office, like that's what they had to deal with, nothing electronic. The companies have it electronically, but they're not sharing it with the states. So the states are having to figure out how to sift through data to even identify risk, even before they get to the stage of how they're going to react to it. And they're doing it using 1990 era uh, information systems. So just I think we're getting close, yes? I will. Anyway, this is, these are some of the earthquakes that have been happening in Oklahoma. Um, 2011, Prague, Oklahoma. Um, this is the one that led to really serious injury as well. There's a, a woman who was very seriously injured when the, the brick from her fireplace fell on her. Uh, she's had multiple knee surgeries and reconstructive surgery on one of her legs. That case is continuing. Cushing, Oklahoma, what's important about Cushing, Oklahoma, is this is where all of, or most of the major oil and natural gas transmission pipelines for the United States cross through. They intersect in Cushing. So when you have this kind of damage happening in Cushing, you potentially have a really huge problem. And so industry in 2015 started to get serious about this. Until 2015, despite the numbers, the hundreds of earthquakes of at least magnitude three happening every year in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma government and industry there were saying, it's just nature, this just happens sometimes. We haven't you know, had earthquakes here. I think they'd had a, a, a magnitude three last, like in the, in one in 1952, and that was it for recorded uh, over three magnitude earthquakes in Oklahoma. But you know, they figured it was just natural, it was cyclical. There's similar arguments that you hear with climate change. When Cushing hit, this really changed, um, and that's when Oklahoma put up a website, started saying, yes, this is tied to the oil and gas industry. We think it's wastewater disposal that's causing this. We're tracking this. Please send us information. And that was with the blessing of industry, because at that point, that scared them. There were a few uh, pretty big ones as well last year. It has slowed down a little bit this year, mostly because of the downturn in production. There's just fewer um, wells being produced and fewer gallons of wastewater being disposed of. So this is another place I found we really needed information. It turned out Oklahoma didn't even know where some of these faults were. They still don't know where some of these faults are. The companies know where the faults are, but the companies don't want to disclose we know where a fault is and we're still using this wastewater well to dispose our water. They're worried about liability. And so the one project that I'm working on now is trying to figure out how do we address this. In the meantime, liability it's uncertain for everyone in this space. For somebody to say that I can figure out which of all of these wells caused an earthquake and then did, you know, created tremors that got, reached my town and damaged my home, the amount of expert witnesses they need, the amount of technical expertise, um, it's extremely technical, very, very difficult to show legal causation. And so we're finding that uh, most people don't have earthquake coverage. When they do, they're not getting they're often not getting recovery anyway. And when they're going to court, there hasn't been a single successful conclusion to a lawsuit. And so we've been looking at compensation funds and figuring out if that's a way of bridging this gap and also using compensation funds. Like if a company wants to be part of the compensation fund, they need to pay in and they need to be willing to provide a certain amount of information about faults that they know about. And then in there up to a certain point if it's no fault. If they've obviously, if they violate a permit, they should not be able to use the fund. But if it's damage up to a certain amount and they were working within their permit, you could have a payout through this program rather than 
from the company. So I'll end there. Just to be mindful for people who need to get to class, I think it's probably better to sort of invite people up to ask questions up front and let you go and we'll stop our presentation now. But thank you so much. What a fascinating presentation.